Part Three of The Wheels of Chance. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Wheels of Chance by H. G. Wells. Chapter Six On the Road to Ripley. In the fullness of time, Mr. Hoopdriver drew near the Marquis of Granby at Escher, and as he came under the railway arch and saw the inn in front of him, he mounted his machine again and rode bravely up to the doorway. Burton and biscuit and cheese he had, which, indeed, is Burton in its proper company, and as he was eating there came a middle-aged man in a drab cycling suit, very red and moist and angry in the face, and asked bitterly for a lemon squash. He sat down in a seat in the bar and mopped his face, but scarcely had he sat down before he got up again and started out of the doorway. "'Damn!' he said. Then, "'Damn fool!' "'Aye,' said Mr. Hoopdriver, looking around suddenly with a piece of cheese in his cheek. The man in drab faced him. "'I called myself a damn fool, sir. Have you any objection?' "'Oh, none, none,' said Mr. Hoopdriver. "'I thought you spoke to me. I didn't hear what you said.' To have a completative disposition and an energetic temperament, sir, is hell. Hell, I tell you, a contemplative disposition and a phlegmatic temperament all very well, but energy and philosophy? Mr. Hoopdriver looked as intelligent as he could, but said nothing. There's no hurry, sir, none whatever. I came out for exercise, general exercise, and to notice the scenery and to botanize, and no sooner do I get on that accursed machine then off I go, hammer and tongs. I never looked to right or left, never noticed a flower, never saw a view, got hot, juicy, red like a grilled chop. Here I am, sir, come from Guildford, in something under an hour. Why, sir? Mr. Hoopdriver shook his head. Because I'm a damn fool, sir, because I've reservoirs and reservoirs of muscular energy, and one or other of them is always leaking. It's a most interesting road, birds and trees, I've no doubt and wayside flowers, and there's nothing I should enjoy more than watching them, but I can't. Get me on that machine, and I have to go. Get me on anything, and I have to go, and I don't want to go a bit. Why should a man rush about like a rocket, all pace and fizzle? Why, it makes me furious. I can assure you, sir, I go scorching along the road and cursing aloud at myself for doing it. A quiet, dignified, philosophical man, that's what I am, at bottom." and here I am dancing with rage and swearing like a drunken tinker at a perfect stranger. But my way's wasted, I've lost all the country road, and now I'm on the fringe of London, and I might have loitered all the morning. Ugh! Thank heaven, sir, you have not the irritable temperament, that you are not goaded to madness by your endogenous sneers, by the eternal wrangling of an uncomfortable soul and body. I tell you, I lead a cat-and-dog life. But what is the use of talking? It's all of a piece. He tossed his head with unspeakable self-disgust, pitched the lemon squash into his mouth, paid for it, and without any further remark strode to the door. Mr. Hoopdriver was still wondering what to say when his interlocutor vanished. There was a noise of a foot spurning the gravel, and when Mr. Hoopdriver reached the doorway, the man in drab was a score of yards Londonward. He had already gathered pace. He pedalled with ill-suppressed anger, and his head was going down. In another moment he flew swiftly out of sight under the railway arch, and Mr. Hoopdriver saw him no more. CHAPTER Seven. After this whirlwind Mr. Hoopdriver paid his reckoning, and being now a little rested about the muscles of the knees, resumed his saddle and rode off in the direction of Ripley, along an excellent but undulating road. He was pleased to find his command over his machine already sensibly increased. He set himself little exercises as he went along, and performed them with varying success. There was, for instance, steering, in between a couple of stones, say a foot apart, a deed of little difficulty so far as the front wheel is concerned, but the back wheel, not being under the sway of the human eye, is apt to take a vicious jump over the obstacle, which sends a violent concussion all along the spine to the skull, and will even jerk a loose-fastened hat over the eyes, and so lead to much confusion. And again, there was taking the hand or hands off the handlebar, a thing and a simple thing in itself, but complex in its consequences. This particularly was a feat Mr. Hoopdriver desired to do, 
for several divergent reasons but at present it simply led to convulsive balancings and novel inelegant modes of dismounting the human nose is at best a needless excrescence there are those who consider it ornamental and would regard a face deprived of its assistance with pity or derision but it is doubtful whether our esteemed is dedicated so much by a sense of its absolute beauty as by the vitiating effect of a universally prevalent fashion in the case of bicycle students as the young of both sexes its inutility is aggravated by its persistent annoyance it requires constant attention until one can ride with one hand and search for secure and use a pocket handkerchief with the other cycling is necessarily a constant series of descents nothing can be further from the author's ambition than a wanton realism but mr hoopdriver's nose is a plain and salient fact and face it we must and in addition to this inconvenience there are flies until the cyclist can steer with one hand his face is given over to beelzebub contemplative flies stroll over it a trifle absently with its most sensitive surfaces the only way to dislodge them is to shake the head forcibly and to writhe one's features violently this is not only a lengthy and frequently ineffectual method but one exceedingly terrifying to foot passengers and again sometimes the beginner rides for a space with one eye closed by perspiration giving him a waggish air foreign to his mood and ill calculated to overawe the impertinent however you will appreciate now the motive of mr hoopdriver's experiments he presently attained sufficient dexterity to slap himself smartly and violently in the face with his right hand without certainly overturning the machine but his pocket handkerchief might have been in california for any good it was to him while he was in the saddle yet you must not think that because mr hoopdriver was a little uncomfortable he was unhappy in the slightest degree in the background of his consciousness was the sense that about this time briggs would be halfway through his window dressing and gosling the apprentice busy with a chair turned over the counter and his ears very red trying to roll a piece of huckaback only those who have rolled pieces of huckaback know quite how detestable huckaback is to roll and the shop would be dusty and perhaps the governor about and snappy and here was quiet and greenery and one mucked about as the desire took one without a soul to see and here was no wailing of sane no folding of remnants no voice to shout hoopdriver forward and once he almost ran over something wonderful a little low red beast with a yellowish tail that went rushing across the road before him it was the first weasel he had ever seen in his cockney life there were miles of this scores of miles of this before him pinewood and oak forest purple heathery moorland and grassy down lush meadows where shining rivers wound their lazy ways villages with square towered flint churches and rabbling cheap and hardy inns clean white country towns long downhill stretches where one might ride at one's ease overlooking a jolt or so and far away at the end of it all the sea what mattered a fly or so in the dawn of these delights perhaps he had been dashed a minute by the shameful episode of the young lady in grey and perhaps the memory of it was making itself a little layer in a corner of his brain from which it could distress him in the retrospect by suggesting that he looked like a fool but for the present the, that trouble was altogether in abeyance the man in drab evidently a swell had spoken to him as his equal and the knees of his brown suit and the checkered stockings were ever before his eyes or rather you could see the stockings by carrying the head a little to one side and to feel little by little his mastery over this delightful treacherous machine growing and growing every half mile or so his knees reasserted themselves and he dismounted and sat a while by the roadside it was at a charming little place between escher and cobham where a bridge crosses a stream that mr hoopdriver came across the other cyclist in brown it is well to notice the fact here although the interview was of the slightest because it happened that subsequently hoopdriver saw a great deal more of this other man in brown the other cyclist in brown had a machine of dazzling newness and a punctured pneumatic lay across his knees he was a man of thirty or more 
with a whitish face, an aquiline nose, a lank flaxen moustache, and very fair hair. And he scowled at the job before him. At the sight of him, Mr. Hoopdriver pulled himself together and rode by with the air of one born to the wheel. A splendid morning, said Mr. Hoopdriver. A fine surface. The morning and you and the surface be everlastingly damned, said the other man in brown as Hoopdriver receded. Hoopdriver heard the mumble and did not distinguish the words, and he felt a pleasing sense of having duly asserted the wide sympathy that binds cyclists together of having behaved himself as becomes one of the brotherhood of the wheel. The other man in brown watched his receding aspect. "'Greasy proletarian,' said the other man in brown, feeling a prophetic dislike. "'Got a suit of brown, the very picture of this. One would think his sole aim of in life had been to character me. It's fortune's way with me. Look at the insteps of the treadles. Why does heaven make such men?' and having lit a cigarette, the other man in brown returned to the business in hand. Mr. Hoopdriver worked up the hill towards Cobham, to a point that he felt sure was out of sight of the other man in brown, and then he dismounted and pushed his machine until the proximity of the village, and a proper pride drove him into the saddle again. CHAPTER Eight. Beyond Cobham came a delightful incident, delightful, that is, in its beginning, if a trifle indeterminate in the retrospect. It was, perhaps, halfway between Cobham and Ripley. Mr. Hoopdriver dropped down a little hill, where, unfenced from the road, fine mossy trees and bracken lay on either side, and looking up he saw an open country before him, covered with heather and set with pines, and a yellow road running across it, and half a mile away, perhaps, a little grey figure by the wayside waving something white. "'Never,' said Mr. Hoopdriver, with his hands tightening on the handles. He resumed the treadles, staring away before him, jolted over a stone, wabled, recovered, and began riding faster at once, with his eyes ahead. "'It can't be,' said Hoopdriver. He rode his straightest, and kept his pedals spinning, albeit a limp numbness had resumed possession of his legs. "'It can't be,' he repeated, feeling every moment more assured that it was— "'Lord, I don't know even now,' said Mr. Hoopdriver, legs a-whirling, and then, "'Blow my legs!' But he kept on, and drew nearer and nearer, breathing hard and gathering flies like a flypaper. In the valley he was hidden. Then the road began to rise, and the resistance of the pedals grew. As he crested the hill, he saw her, not a hundred yards away from him. "'It's her,' he said. "'It's her, right enough. It's the suits that's done it which was truer even than Mr. Hoopdriver thought. But now she was not waving her handkerchief. She was not even looking at him. She was wheeling her machine slowly along the road towards him, and admiring the pretty wooden hills toward Weybridge. She might have been unaware of his existence for all the recognition he got. For a moment horrible doubts troubled Mr. Hoopdriver. Had that handkerchief been a dream? Besides which, he was deliquescent and scarlet, and felt so. It must be her coquetry. The handkerchief was indisputable. Should he ride up to her and get off? Or get off and walk up to her? It was as well she didn't look, because he would certainly capsize if he lifted his cap. Perhaps that was her consideration. Even as he hesitated, he was upon her. She must have heard his breathing. He gripped the brake. Steady. His right leg waved in the air, and he came down heavily and staggered but erect. She turned her eyes upon him with admirable surprise. Mr. Hoopdriver tried to smile pleasantly, hold up his machine, raise his cap, and bow gracefully. Indeed, he felt that he did as much. He was a man singularly devoid of the minute of self-consciousness, and he was quite unaware of a tail of damp hair lying across his forehead, and just clearing the eyes, and of the general disorder of his coiffure. There was an interrogative pause. "'What can I have the pleasure?' began Mr. Hoopdriver, insinuatingly. "'I mean, remembering his emancipation and abruptly assuming his most aristocratic intonation. "'Can I be of any assistance to you?' "'The young lady in grey bit her lower lip and said very prettily, "'None, thank you.' "'She glanced away from him and made as if she would proceed. "'Oh,' 
said Mr. Hoopdriver, taken aback and suddenly crestfallen again. It was so unexpected. He tried to grasp the situation. Was she coquetting, or had he... Excuse me one minute, he said, as she began to wheel her machine again. Yes, she said, stopping and staring a little with the colour in her cheeks deepening. I should not have alighted if I had not imagined that you waved something white. He paused. She looked at him doubtfully. He had seen it. She decided that he was not an unredeemable rough taking advantage of a mistake, but an innocent soul meaning well while seeking happiness. I did wave my handkerchief, she said. I'm very sorry. I'm expecting a friend, a gentleman. She seemed to flush pink for a moment. He is riding a bicycle and dressed in brown, and at a distance, you know. Oh, quite, said Mr. Hoopdriver, bearing up in a manly fashion against his bitter disappointment. Certainly. I'm awfully sorry, you know, troubling you to dismount and all that. No trouble, I assure you, said Mr. Hoopdriver mechanically, and bowing over his saddle as if it was a counter. Somehow he could not find it in his heart to tell her that the man was beyond there with a punctured pneumatic. He looked back along the road and tried to think of something else to say, but the gulf in the conversation widened rapidly and hopelessly. "'There's nothing further,' began Mr. Hoopdriver desperately, recurring his stock of clichés. "'Nothing, thank you,' she said decisively, and immediately, "'This is Ripley Road.' "'Certainly,' said Mr. Hoopdriver. "'Ripley is about two miles from here, according to the milestones.' "'Thank you,' she said warmly. "'Thank you so much. I felt sure there was no mistake, and I really am awfully sorry.' "'Don't mention it,' said Mr. Hoopdriver. "'Don't mention it.' He hesitated and gripped his handles to mount. "'It's me,' he said. "'Ought to be sorry.' "'Should he say it?' "'Was it an impertinence? Anyhow. Not being the other gentleman, you know.' He tried a quietly insinuating smile that he knew for a grin even as he smiled felt she disapproved, then she despised him, was overcome with shame at her expression, turned his back upon her, and began, very clumsily, to mount. He did so with a horrible swerve, and went pedalling off, riding very badly, as he was only too painfully aware. Nevertheless, thank heaven for mounting. He could not see her, because it was so dangerous for him to look round, but he could imagine her indignant and pitiless, he felt an unspeakable idiot. One had to be so careful what one said to young ladies, and he'd gone and treated her just as though she was only a larky girl. It was unforgivable. He always was a fool. You could tell from her manner. She didn't think him a gentleman. One glance, and she seemed to look clear through him, and all his pretense. What rot it was venturing to speak to a girl like that. With her education she was bound to see through him at once. How nicely she spoke, too. Nice, clear-cut words. She made him feel what slush his own accent was. And that last silly remark, what was it? Not being the other gentleman, you know. No point in it. And gentlemen, what could she be thinking of him? But really, the young lady in grey had dismissed Hoopdriver from her thoughts almost before he had vanished round the corner. She had thought no ill of him. His manifest awe and admiration of her had given her not an atom of offence, but for her just now there were weightier things to think about, things that would affect all the rest of her life. She continued slowly, walking her machine Londonward. Presently she stopped. "'Oh, why doesn't he come?' she said, and stamped her foot petulantly. Then, as if in answer, coming down the hill among the trees, appeared the other man in brown, dismounted and wheeling his machine. End of Part 3